Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, I, one of the things, um, well, we'll just move on from there. All right, we're going to start. Uh, I, I don't want to, I'll it'll take me too long. So um, we're going to uh, continue our series on whole family this morning. Uh, and I, I've been, re- I've just really been enjoying this, getting ready for this series and, and uh, even just kind of lining out what, it, what would we want to talk about? Uh, Lord, what are you saying to the, in this time? How many of you know? There's different seasons in your families that you deal with different things. Um, And it seems like sometimes there's this going on and sometimes there's this going on. But how many of you know the right word or the right thing at the right time is what you're looking for? You know, you, you go to the cabinet looking for this certain, this certain medicine to take care of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, I see this. I see that. I see that. I'm looking for the allergy medicine. I, I see cold and flu. I see this. But I, what I'm looking for is Claritin. Or I'm look, you want the right, I, I, yeah, okay, there's some Excedrin. I got a headache too, but I want the runny nose thing too. You want the right medicine. How many of you know God's word is, is truly, it's, it's health to our bodies, the Bible talks about how his words, and I did eat them, like they're, they're health. And so in family, in, in times of family, it's important that we have the right words, not just uh, ones that would be blanket as far as like, well, here's how you parent, you know, spank to not spank or whatever. We're, we're not talking about that today. What we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the thief in the home. We're going to talk, in a, so I, the title this morning in, in whole family is The Thief. Did you know that there, oftentimes we lock doors uh, every night? How many of you have that, are, are the door locker of your house? Who's the door locker? Okay. Okay. How many, are there dads here that you're not the door locker? Your wife always locks the door every night. Raise your hand. Okay. Every night your, your wife has already went over there and she dead bolted that door and dead bolted that door. Right. I don't usually check that. To be quite honest, my wife's already got that done. So she, you know, she hits all the doors, whatever, and boom, boom, boom. All right. And so I'm like, oh, that's cool. Uh, That's what happens. Why does she do that? Because she doesn't want somebody coming in the house. So she locks the door. Have you ever come home? Maybe you're, um, we're living in a rent house right now, and that front door handle sometimes will stick. So when you close the door, uh, the little latch, you know, that would keep it closed, and it doesn't, it doesn't catch. So though it's locked, it didn't catch. It stayed in the deal. So you'll come home, and this has happened a couple of times. I've come home, and I'm like, why is the door open? How many of you know if the door's open, you ever come home, and the door's open, something's off, any dad's ever been, had to go through the daggum house with the baseball bat or your nine on your side, and you're like, you know, I actually almost shot my son one night. Um, actually, I didn't almost shoot him, but I had a gun, and he was scared out of his mind. But in the middle of the night, he got up and went out to the garage and went outside, and I heard this noise. And so I came. This is Matthew. Matthew, uh, he's like, don't shoot, don't shoot. Well, I had made it all the way out, and I hear this noise coming. I'm right behind the door. I'm ready to just, and when I opened that door, rather than pull the gun, the first thing I said, I said, hey, you know. And he bought wet his pants. <laughs> and, and I did. I had my gun, um, one of the many, and, uh, and it was the judge, and it was about to be judge, right? <laughs> because something was out of order. There was something out of place. And have you ever had something out of place, and you, you knew that something was out of place? You, you didn't know why it was out of place, but that's not right. And so you're going to do everything you can to discover it and to, to make sure that you can go to bed or you can, you, your family's safe. But a good thief doesn't even, you don't even know that the door's not left open. You know, a good thief, like one that, the one that is skilled, in, he doesn't leave fingerprints. He's there and he's gone and you don't even know that it's missing until a little bit later. You're like, hey, honey, where's, have you seen the, 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 the? just in and out, undetected, and then they get away with it. You don't know to file a police report right away. It's just gone. It's just gone. In our homes, I, I, there's this thief that I, I believe is running, a, running a, my, about in our homes right now, in families, and more than ever before. And this, this thief, uh, and I want to go, I want to start this morning by going to the scripture, John chapter 10, verse 10. And maybe you're familiar with this scripture, but I want to, uh, in this, in the scripture, there is a, there is an understanding, um, the bottom portion of it, that if you and I truly don't believe 
the thief will be allowed to run around in our lives. So it says this. It says, now the thief comes. Uh, he doesn't come except for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Who's the thief? Help me out. Satan's the thief. Satan's the thief. But I have come. Who, who's I? Jesus. Jesus came, and he came with the good news. He came to, to preach the gospel. To, to, uh, if you look in, in Luke chapter 4, he tells us what the gospel is. And he says, I have come that you could have life and that you could have it more abundantly. That you might have life, life, and more life, one translation says. That you would have life and have it more abundantly. If you don't believe that Jesus came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly, then what's going to happen is, in your and my lives, there will be a thief allowed to run amok because what's going to be driving our life is ambition. And, uh, and not just ambition, this is the thief we're going to talk about this morning, the thief of comparison. Stealing joy. Stealing, or let's say, that doesn't just steal. It, it, how many of you know it, it breeds things? In, in homes right now, in families. Because we're not just talking about comparing and like, oh, they have this big house and they have this car. Let's talk about sons. Let's talk about daughters. Let's talk about sibling rivalry. Let's talk about in-laws. When you compare your mom and dad with their mom and dad, comparison. How many of you know it fuels... It fuels things. It fuels rejection. It fuels uh, even pride. It fuels a, a division because you're comparing, well, well they're, they give my kids good Christmas presents and they give nothing. I mean, they didn't even send Christmas presents. How many of you know if, if one side gives, you, gives your kids Christmas presents, but the other side doesn't give them any Christmas presents, how many of you know when you compare those two, then one is going to get a little bit more love, maybe, favor, or one is going to be esteemed higher, and maybe the other one's going to be rejected a little bit more, and then when something happens because of that, now you're, you're a little bit more easy to not believe the best about that one. Just, again, comparison. It's a thief. It's a thief. It comes to steal. It comes to kill. It comes to destroy. It comes to, it pours and it breeds into our families. It, uh, rejection? Comparison. When you and I, when comparison's in your mind, and I got three boys, but if, if, if comparison is part of your, in your home and in your mind, and you go, well, this brother is, he's worse than I am. So what did that just breed into you? What's it growing? I'm the good one. Wow. It breeds pride. It also breeds rejection. Anger. All, I mean, it just all kinds of stuff. You, you, we're going to look at some of these stories, but it, it, it's, it's amazing what comparison can do. Comparison. It's a thief. It steals joy. This morning, uh, I was going to show the little video we videoed it um, uh, during huddle with our serve team. I gave trolley gummy worms out to, uh, to little kids, right? How many of you like trolley gummy worms, right? I, I love trolley gummy worms. Well, I bought a bag that had a bunch of mini bags of trolley gummy worms, which is so cool. Kids are like, oh, I want trolleys. So here they are getting trolleys. I want two, right? Uh, can I have more, right? And so it's chaos, right? Trying to give out these trolley gummy worms to the, these kids. There's, I had eight of them come up, and I had a whole bag, box, or basket full of candy. And so I handed out trolleys, and then I skipped somebody because, well, they're little kids. And when they get skipped, they're like, that's not fair, <laughs> right? And then you skip when you go to the next one, and they're like, oh. and then I think I gave one of them two, and they're like, and, and so I'm like, who else doesn't have one over here? There's this little girl. She's just being patient. And she's like, I haven't got mine yet. Who else hasn't got? And so I was trying to decipher. And so then I reach in. You, oh, you didn't get yours? So I gave another little trolley over. And then uh, who else didn't get there? Oh, yeah. So then I reach into my basket. And underneath of the, all the little candies, I had a medium-sized bag of trolleys. And I pulled that one out. And I go, oh, here you go. And I think that's when one of them said, that's not fair. And, uh, and I said, is there anyone else? And the only one that didn't was this little girl on the end over here. And, and I said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, let's see here. And I pull out the giant king-size 
bag of trolleys and and I come over and I give it to her and and it was kind of like it's kind of like our, us in life like I was doing super good in life and, until I saw what they had yeah. I was doing so good in life until I saw that they got a bigger one or a better one or a faster one or a cooler one or you know there's there's just there's breeds of comparison is just it's a thief but it does it it changes whole family trees Comparison. We're going to get into this and why comparison is such a thief. It steals destinies. But it really, it doesn't, when I say it steals destinies, that's what I, I more than anything else, I, I believe comparison steals destinies. It steals the reason you were alive. You're doing what somebody else is doing. Like you take a class in, in high school, in middle school, as you begin to try to discover who you are, you're trying to figure out what you're supposed to do. And all of your friends are playing football. So guess what you're going to go do? You're going to go try and play football. And you might not even start, but you want to hang out with your friends. But you could have been polishing a different rock in a sense and, and developing what you were created for. But instead you wanted to be, well, I need to be like everyone else. It starts at a very young age, and that comparison can, can cause you and me to, to, to be robbed. If you have three sons like I do, and, and one of them is playing sports, and the other one just, they want to play sports, and then the other one wants to play sports, but they're not all the same at sports, and they're not all gifted equally at the same sports. I got my youngest one, who might be my least athletic yet, uh, yet he's growing to be the big little brother. Except um, he's extremely gifted with hand-eye coordination and throwing. He can hit a ball, a baseball. Caleb can hit a baseball like nobody else in our family. Since he was little, his hand-eye coordination off the charts. But we said we're not going to play summer baseball. So he's had us, my, and so he, my kids get used in analogies because I'm a pastor, right? They're pastor's kids. That's just part of it. But he, he can hit a, a ball, can be coming in, whack, hand-eye coordination, on the fly. And, his, and the older two are like, holy cow, this kid. Oh, we need, you know. But, but, but well, he can feel dis, discontented when he tries to be the running back or something that he is not made to do. You've not been made to do or been made to be. And so let's, we're going to look at a couple a couple. Um, Examples of just real quick, and then we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of this this morning, but how it steals destinies and changes family trees. You remember in Exodus 13 with the children of Israel? Exodus 13, 33, they said, they compared themselves to the giants of the land when they went in, and they said, we were like to them grasshoppers in our eyes and in theirs. I don't think they asked them, but they knew. They were comparing, and that's how we were, and that's how, and so it changed, how many of you know that? That changed their family tree. Because they compared themselves with those, they, it changed their family tree. I think that one of the, the one I want to just hit on just for a moment is this, and I, I can see this. Um, and so you see that all the children of Israel, but I want to just talk about Saul for a moment. Saul, King Solomon, one who was the first king of Israel. The very first king, the one that the children of Israel were like, we don't want to just have no king. We want to be like the other nations. We want a king. And so they anointed, uh, Saul got anointed, chosen by God to be king. Saul, tall, handsome, dark, like this man, gifted, called of God. And he was wonderful until, until you see this song being sung or these statements. When, and this happens um, in our lives. Let's put it up to 1 Samuel 18, 7. I want you to see this because I want you to kind of put this, let this play in your mind. As they danced, they sang, oh, Saul has slain his thousands, but David, he's got ten thousands. Did you see he's done the ten thousands? Oh, David has done the ten thousands. So Saul is hearing these songs and there's ladies singing in the streets about how great Saul is, but how much greater, how much greater David is. It was at this point in Saul's, and not just Saul, but the entire lineage of his family began to change, and he began to be robbed of, robbed of what his kids, 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 where they were to be. They were to be in a palace. They were to be prince. They were to be queen or queen, uh, queen or, or uh, princess. There it is, what I was looking for. 
But they're not anymore. How? It all started right here. Comparison. As he heard what he wasn't. Have you heard anybody talk about their new car or their new house or let's say their new job or it could be anything. Uh, for me, sometimes it's this. It comes to me this way uh, where people will come and they'll say, oh, did you hear about this going on at this new church or this new? And what you hear is you hear, I'm, I've killed the thousands. My car is the thousands. But they got a 10,000, 10 times better. And so what you begin to look at is what you're not, what you don't have. You begin to see what you can't do. You begin to, you, you, confusion sets in. This is what happens. Confusion sets in. And confusion it, it has its roots in comparison. Let's look here uh, to, at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. We're going to take a, uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time in here this morning. Second Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 7. This is the New King James. We'll be jumping from New King James, NIV uh, as well. But here's the New King James. It says, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? This is how you know that you are really great at com comparing. Like, are you, are you and me given to like look at things according to the outward appearance? Like here, here would be a question. Um, is somebody doing good because they're driving a nice vehicle? In your mind, but the, in your mind, in our mind, how many times do we see the ride, and we see the wheels, we see the, and we think, God, they're blessed. I wish I was blessed like that. Or maybe, maybe your, your brother or your sister or your whatever, they do something good on a test, and they get the A and the blue ribbon sticker, and you go, man, they're awesome. I wish I was that smart, and the whole time they've been cheating. You don't know that. But you've been, I'm just stupid. I'm never going to be what they're going to be. Well, you're not to be what they're, gonna, they're supposed to be. You're to be you, but because you don't, because you see yourself less than because of what you are, the thief is in your home. He's stealing and he's killing and he's destroying your identity and what you've been created to be and who you, and your desires, what you like. There's people trying to do things in life uh, because of what somebody else has. Actually, we'll just jump there right now. Ecclesiastes 4.4. 4. It says this, and how many of you know who wrote Ecclesiastes? Anybody? Solomon, right? Here's what he says. I, I, I observed that most people in life, how, they're motivated to success because of what their neighbors have. Why do you want the bigger house? Well, because that's what everybody has on Pinterest. Or that's what the... Why do you want what you want? Why do we want? And here's this. Solomon, he said, I, you know what I've noticed? You know what I've observed? Most of the time, the bigger house... the like, my car was working great, but did you see it came out of it with a new one? No, I didn't until I noticed that they had that. Like, I love my bow, but I don't need a new one. But I kind of want a new one because my buddy went and got a new one. But mine has killed more deer than his new one. But if I get that new one, maybe that will help me kill more deer. Then I can catch up, and then he'll get a new one, or I'll get a new one, and then he'll want a new one. This happens all the time. Happens all the time. And where we're motivated, hey, why do you want to... So let's just talk. I'm talking to me in our families. You see that this family over here, well, look, at they're doing these family devotions, and they're all sitting around singing Kumbaya, and, and you've seen it on somewhere, right? And you're like, we're starting family devotions. Everybody come over here and sit down right here. Sit down now. Sit down. Sit down. Shut your mouth. We're going to learn from the Lord today. Right now. How many times? That's not for you. You started that because of what you saw them do. And, and the reality is what you're going to see, we're going to look at this in Scripture, but there's so many times that people are flourishing in life because of their grace, and they're not stewarding that grace to even just this much. 
and you're trying to put all the effort in just to, to uh, get your rise to the level of what they're doing with no work and their grace, and so you're putting all this effort in just to get to here, and what's going to happen one day is there's going to be a test of fire, and the Lord's like, hey, I gave you all of this grace. I gave you a grace to give. Yeah, you're dropping a hundred or a thousand bucks, but I gave you a grace to give. What are you doing with that grace? Well, I, I'm the number one giver in the church. Okay, that's great because the grace that you have, you, you could be the number one giver in the whole state. Or the grace that you have, let's talk sports. You just, you just got it, bro. Like muscles and like you don't do anything. You're not in the gym like everybody else. Or you are, but you don't have to put out the effort. You just show up and you blow up and everyone's like, oh. It was born. It was given to you. But, but what, what, what extra are you putting on it? So, so it's, just such a, it's such a lie when you and I look, look go back to 2 Corinthians 10, 7, when you and I look according or with our eyes, we can be duped. We can, come, we can 100% be duped and, and wonder why this is going on or this is going on. We can be fooled. So he says, do you look according to the outward appearance? Um, He's talking about what he's talking ultimately about. He's bringing correction to the church at Corinth here about who they're receiving from uh, and how they're not receiving the word of God like they used to because there's now some super apostles in, his, in their midst. Now, what is a super apostle? Basically, it's this. They look good. They talk good. And they let everybody else know how good they are and how much better they are than Paul and Timothy and how they've come to a newer, greater revelation, but they're moving from Christ and away from Christ, and Paul's having to correct them and say, listen, I've never came to you to try to be like, look at me. I never came to you, and I never said, I got this going on, I got this going on, and I did this, and I'm from here, and I'm from here. I could boast about all these things, but I'm not coming to you boasting and saying, look at me, look at me. I came to just simply preach the preach the word, and now you have begun to look, and you now, you're beginning to look according to the outward appearance. You're now taking your lead, and you're taking your move, and we're moving in life. This is what I, we're, we're moving in life, we're moving in our families based on an outward appearance over here. Can I tell you, even with your kids, if you see an outward appearance, if you only address the outside Instead of asking the Lord what, what, what the root is, you're going to be just mowing the grass. When there's something underneath of all of that, and it probably didn't need an explosion up here, it needed a, a different word imparted here. So he says this, so uh, if anyone is convinced uh, in himself that he is uh, Christ, let him again consider that, it, it, that this in himself... Um, that just as he is Christ, even so are we in Christ. In other words, he's basically saying, um, we're, we're still in Christ. Like we're, I, I, I don't know how we're classifying people based upon appearance. And he keeps on going here. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 10, 12, just a little bit further down. He says, we don't dare. We don't dare to classify or compare ourselves with someone who commends themselves. We, we don't dare do that. It's, it's not... It, 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 the, here, when you say, I dare you to do something, and someone takes the dare, they reason the odds, it's worth it, that I can do it, or that they're going to get something good back. They're going to conquer that. By, in other words, Paul would say, if I was to compare myself, I could say, well, I'm better, and I'll come out on top. He said, we don't even dare do that, because it, we're going down a, a, a slippery slope that is unwise. He says this, when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, it's a lot of themselves, they are not wise. And this word right here talking about they're not wise, when you and I compare ourselves with each other, and I say, oh, how am I doing? Well, I'm doing good. Well, compared to them. Well, how am I doing? Well, I'm not doing that good compared to them. So I'm built up here, so we start to hang out. We want to be the top. How, why is that? That everyone wants to be the top of their what, we want to be the top of our, help me out. 
or the, if you're in the class, you're the top of the, and so what, people, this is how you always want to rise. You want to find your class and you want to rise to the top of your class. You, God forbid you're going to go step up in the, you know, the higher class because then you'd be at the bottom of the, this is, we, we, we measure ourselves and compare ourselves by ourselves and we become, we literally become unwise. And what that means is this, you struggle to put together. See, wisdom has the ability to take something and assemble it. By wisdom, a house is built. But if you look this up and go pull it up in the Greek, it just simply means you no longer are able to put together. So it's kind of like building Legos. And I used this analogy this morning in Huddle where at Christmas when my kids were young, we would get them Legos. I got three boys. And so each one of them have different personalities, like different colors. And so while you're getting the Legos, you don't just get all the same. You get one monster truck, one race car, one boat, right? And, and everyone opens their Legos and they're like, yeah, Christmas Day. They're putting the Legos together and it's great. But it's not so great if I was to take those instructions and switch them up. Because they wouldn't be able to build what they were created to build. And there would be frustration if, let's say, I left somebody else and they've got their motorcycle built and I gave them the instructions. There'd be frustration that they're trying to build that motorcycle with parts that's for the monster truck. And the whole time, God knew that they wanted the monster truck or their dad knew that that's what they would like. And, and so they're trying to build a motorcycle with monster truck parts and they wonder why in life they're frustrated and they can't put it together. You can't put it together because you're looking at things out here or according to the flesh. You're looking at things as they appear. When, how are you and I to be led? How are you and I to be looking at things? Romans chapter 8 tells us this. I don't give you this verse. It says that, that when our mindset is on the things of the flesh, it leads to death. But when we, our mind is set on the things of God or the things of the Spirit, it brings life. So we're going to look at some practical, how does that, how do we get to there? Again, Hebrews 10 verse 18, as it, the same thought of this chapter 10, it says, for it it is not the one who commends himself who is approved. It's the one that God approves. So, so many times we're trying to measure ourselves by ourselves or, you know, but that doesn't matter anything. It's not like I'm doing pretty good. If, are your kids doing good because they have a good job? Drive a nice car? What about their salvation? Tell me who's first in their life. I hear moms and dads Say that, oh, they're doing really good. Oh, they got this new job. That's awesome. Or are they going to church anywhere? Are they plugged in? What are, they, are they fulfilling the purpose for which they were created? Right. We measure things so appearance. Yeah. And, and this, is, this is a habit. It's a habit. And, and what you and I do continually, 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 this is what sets culture in our homes. It's what sets culture in our churches. It's what sets culture in school, is it what you do over and over and over again. If I want faith to be in this house, we're going to have to talk faith all the time. If I want love and forgiveness to be in this house, guess what's going to have to be a part of our regular conversation and not just saying walk in love, but actually walk in love. Yeah. Not just one time, oh, I'm going to forgive you on that one and not count that stuff wrong, but all the other ones. How many of you know the culture is set by what you do over and over again? And I, I just am telling you, with what we have in this culture, what we're inundated with we're, is, is all of the keep up with the Joneses, the appearance of what is great, 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 great. And we're in a culture that is saying, do this, you need this, you need that, or look at them. And it didn't just start today. It started all the way back to Cain and Abel. Let's go there. Genesis chapter 4, 1 through 9. Genesis chapter 4, 1 through 9. It says, And Adam had relations. This, this is, since this is a marriage family series, um, this is a good place to start. A Adam made love to his wife, uh, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. So Cain's the oldest. He's the oldest boy. So back in the, this time, how many of you know, like the oldest was... They had the birthright. They had the blessing. They had, like it was, that was a, a, a gift from God. And it even says that here. And it, it goes on to say, so she said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. 
Next. So if you wonder, boys, girl, no, just kidding. All right. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept the flocks and Cain worked the soil. So totally different. Why can't you be more like your brother? Like he's over here. He's, they're doing two totally different things. Now there's probably some kids in between Cape. It says there was another son. There might have been daughters in between. We don't know. Okay. But here we have a, a Cain who is a tiller of the ground. And, we, and so he can grow some stuff pretty good. But Abel, he is a keeper of the sheep, and he can grow some sheep pretty good. I don't know about you, but do you think, could it be maybe that some people are better at raising cattle and some people are better at growing gardens? You think it still could be that way? You think it could be part of a gift or just not just what dad needed done? Could? Not just Adam said, hey, I need you to take care of this. No, it, it could be also just what they were set and gifted to do. So in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portion, from some of the first of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Let's stay back where we're at. right? Let's go. So here we have the, the, this, this picture of Cain and Abel, who are both bringing, but God's not comparing their offerings. He's just saying, this one is not, I'm not accepting this offering. But Cain is comparing his to his brother. God didn't, nowhere in here does it say that God compared Abel and Cain's offering. Nowhere. It just says that God said, that's not what I asked for. So I can't receive that, Cain. I can, I'm going to receive this, but he's not talking. Here's the thing. God doesn't talk to Cain about Abel. In his offering. God will talk to you about you. He, it, this is where we get in trouble. It's like in life, in relationships, God's not talking to you about what your wife needs to do. When it talks in, in Ephesians, it says, now husbands, love your wives. Yeah, you're supposed to love me. Honey, shut your mouth. Right? Or uh, uh, honor your husbands. Yeah, honey, you're supposed to honor me. So, sir, he's talking to the wife here. You've got to recognize that when God is, ta- God is talking to Cain and God is talking to Abel. So you keep on going. And you see that there's offerings brought. And, and Cain is now, he is upset. He's not just upset. He's angry. But then he goes from angry to depressed. Have you ever been there in life? Where you don't know which one to be angry or depressed, angry or depressed, because of what you don't have, because of what you can't do, because of what you don't know, because of what somebody else has, because of you looking at what they got and you don't, because of natural appearance, I'm angry because I want something that I can't have. It sounds like James chapter 4. I want it, but I can't get it, and I can't fulfill it, so I'm wroth inside. That's Cain. He's angry. But he's not only angry, he's depressed. Abel, Abel is, he's just God's favorite. He's, a, he's mom and dad's favorite. I'm just the black sheep. I'm just, that, that's not what God said here. But this is what's going on. And God comes to him and says, hey, Cain, what's going on, man? Why, uh, he asked him a question. He says, Lord, why are you angry? And why are, why are you angry and why are you depressed? Why are you angry and why are you depressed? Well, because he says this, if you do, this would be circled and underlined right here. If you do, if you do what's right, then they're not compared to your brother. If you do what you know to do, what you were told to do, what was you, what you know to do, if you do what you know to do, and this is where, we, this is where we, we need to get back to in our lives. We need to get back to, you're going to see this in Scripture here, we need to pay attention to our own work. You want your, you want your marriage to be awesome? Don't look over what's going on on their date night. Stay at your table. Look at how he's just looking at her. Just look at her. She's got a booger in her nose, buddy. And he's... 
But, do you, but this, is, this really happens. People go out to eat, husbands and wives go out to eat, and they see somebody else on a date, and they spend their time on their phone and looking over at this other guy that's trying to get her number or whatever it might be and wishing that this would be in our relationship. Galatians 6.4, pay attention to your own work. Cain, if you do, if you if, if you do what's right, he said, will you not be accepted also? So your acceptance wasn't because of what your brother, it was because of you. So this is important. Our stewardship. Let's, let's talk about like in life, in business. Don't try to be a bigger business than the guy down the road. Don't try to compete with somebody else. That's Competition is like trying to one-up somebody. It's a chaos place. It's rivalry. It's evil. You weren't created to try to one-up, one-up, one-up. When you, you and I do, angry and depressed. Angry and depressed. How do you know if you're in competition? Anger? Depression. Which one are you? I don't know. Today I'm angry or I'm depressed or I'm happy because I saw that sales were up. Or I'm sad because I saw that sales are down. Or I'm angry because of what I saw here. Or I'm depressed because of what I saw here. How do you know if you're in rivalry with somebody? How do you know if you're comparing? How do you know if you're comparing yourself to your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad? Man, or your marriage to something else. It leads to death. You see here, comparison leads to death. You want your marriage to die? Go, go see what somebody else has. And start fixating on that. You'll stop taking care of what God gave you. And you'll end in divorce. That's how it happens. You, you, you are pulled away. And you begin to look at something else. When the whole time the Lord's like, nope, over here. I, I want to talk to you over here. But nope, I'm over here busy doing this. And I'm looking at what I could have, what I don't have, what I wish I had. I'm angry. I'm sad. I don't know what to do. And it leads, where does it lead? It leads to, it leads to divorce. It's not because someone's bad or good. Sometimes I think we, we put this idea that where even in marriage where something leads to a divorce it's the, or, to, or, or opposition or anger where here's Cain and Abel. Is he bad and he's he good? No, he let something called comparison get the best of him. And he stro- strived and he was supposed to do right where he made a wrong move or sin to miss the mark. Sin wanted to own him and continue his course to continue him down the wrong move. Change his destiny. And it did. You see here it says, if you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin, or it actually the way that this is pictured here, it's like a monster is there crouching. There's a wrong move, and it's saying, it's almost like you're leaning this way, buddy, and there's a, there, he's just waiting for you to look, and look the other direction because you're leaning this way, I can take you over. You're already leaning this way, but if you'll make a move, you can, you can overcome it. It desires to have you, but you can rule over it. Hey, it's right here. He's right there. It's like my, my boys. Uh, sometimes they're not looking, and the couch is like this high on them. And so if they're not looking, sometimes it's just fun to just shove them over the back of the couch. to where. But if they're looking, it's a lot harder. If they're looking, it's a lot harder. If you're aware that you're in the game of comparison, and this is why, or, or there's rivalry or competition going on, you'll realize, wait a minute, I'm making moves that I'm not supposed to be making. And it's because something else has gotten in. And I, I need to do what God's called me to do. I need to go back and tend to my marriage and become be thankful uh, about what God has given me and begin to celebrate what God has given me and steward what God has given me. And you'll find that, that, that you, you begin to, to pour into and, and, and polish and wash your car and, and wash your marriage and wash your house. And, and, and the Bible says that he who's faithful with little, little is given much, but you, you, you don't be faithful with theirs, you be faithful with yours. Be faithful with yours, and, and then you, you, what will happen is yours will increase. 
And it'll be what you want and what you desire and what you long for. Stick to yours. Stick to what God has given you. And he goes on and says that sin is crouching over you to desire, desire to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they're in the field, Cain attacked his brother and he killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know. I don't know. He answered, am I my brother's keeper? This is just, uh, what a picture of how comparison leads to rivalry and ultimately to the death of what God designed. The strength that they were to be to one another. Can I tell you, just like the scripture says, if all were the eye, where all were the hand. You know, if all were the hand, where would be the seeing? If all were the eyes, where would be the smelling? If all were the, we're comparing ourselves. It, let's talk about churches for a moment. If, all, if everybody was like this church, where would be the, this part of the body fulfilling this role? What about this one doing this role? What about this one doing this role? Well, I just want to be over here be the arm. Well, okay, if you're an eye, that would be a very difficult place. You know, be who God's called you to be and be, be content and bring your best into your marriage. Bring your best into your business. Bring your best into your family. Bring your best into your church. Bring your best wherever you are. Galatians 6, 4, again, paying careful attention to your, then to your own work. Why, why? What happens when you pay attention to your own work? For then you'll be satisfied. Then you'll get the satisfaction of what? A job well done. Oh, doesn't it just feel good to look at your flower bed weeded and mulched and be like, oh, that looks so good, doesn't it? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Where maybe you planted a few of your flowers and it looks so good. It, it, everyone can have whatever's going on, but, but you put your work into that and you, put, you trimmed your bushes, you put you mulch on your beds, you got the flowers that you liked and somebody else has all these other whatever kind of flowers, but you like these, and it's like, oh, I love that. All right, going inside. Hey, let's get a lemonade. You, you just, you're satisfied. Let's, 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 let's cut open. Let's just, let's just enjoy it and look at what God has given you. But if you and I are not looking at what we have done in our own work, and we drive down the road and we go, oh, look at their landscaping. That's so awesome. Somebody else is doing it for them. Oh, yeah, the, they're getting it ready to sell because their marriage just got ended in divorce, and they're separating. That's why that person's there doing that. You don't know the story. Oh, oh yeah, they're not, they don't have time for that because they choose it, they're choosing this and to go. You don't know. All I'm saying is this. We make stories up in our minds of some green grass. Grass is green a lot of times because of fertilizer. So let's go, let's go back to when I look at how I'm doing based upon how they're doing, I'm unwise. I'm unwise. So are you looking, am I looking according to outward appearance? As a pastor, if I come to church and there's not very many people in the congregation, and let's say I preach the house down, just oh, with fire, let's say there's just awesome, the, the worship is Amazing, like just not a dry eye in the place, just not very many eyes. And afterwards, I'm like, where was everybody at today? Where was everybody? Freaking, 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 freaking. I just suck. I'm just going to quit. What's the point? Angry, depressed. Marriage, as a child, in a, in a family, it's the same, it's the same role. Mar because of what I'm looking at. Because I'm given to looking at natural appearance. So am I looking at the natural things? Am I, doing, am I doing based upon what somebody else is doing? If so, I'm actually becoming unwise. Now listen to this. Uh, James chapter 3. Again, what, we're, what are we here for? 
2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, just to please God. Just please God. But James chapter 3, this is a passage that you and I might have heard a lot of times, but I want to hear it differently this morning. James 3, 13 through 18. It says, who is wise and understanding among you? Can I say it this way? Those that aren't looking at things according or as they appear. I'll answer that. Who's wise and understanding among you? How, who, who is it? it? It's those that aren't looking at things as they appear or comparing themselves with others because we just learned that if you compare yourself with others, you are actually unwise. So you can't be wise. You can't be wise and compare yourselves to others. So if you're looking for wisdom to build a house or to, to build or to move forward or to advance your marriage or to advance your family, if you're looking for wisdom to move forward and to advance while you're looking at somebody else, can I tell you, you are forfeiting the very thing, the very answer, the very direction that God would be bringing you for you. Because you're looking to them. You're trying to build the monster truck with the directions of the motorcycle. If you and I are looking at someone else, you and I can't move forward. We can't build. Not according to something that will remain. Who is wise and understanding? Let them show it by their good deeds. deeds uh, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. So even just this moment to have humility that come from wisdom, uh, you and I ha can't be in a place where like, I want what they have. I want what they have. There's, the rivalry is not there. There's not rivalry. I don't want to out, out better them. Something done in humility, a deed done in humility is not me getting something, well, they had a red one, I'm gonna, and it's a 2023, I'm going to get the 24. If that's the motivation of your heart. Now, listen, buy your cool new vehicles. That's awesome. I love that. I love wheels on vehicles and stuff. No, that's awesome. That's not the point. The point is what's going on in your heart. The point is your motivation. The point is, is what, how are you looking and what are you chasing? Okay? and Because it, it, it will change destinies. It will cause you to take a job that you weren't supposed to have and miss things you weren't supposed to miss. And now you're chasing your kids. It's I'm, I'll tell you, I've, I've, watched, I've watched comparison steal people's hope. They were so satisfied in their house. But then they saw this other house that they needed. And they tried to figure a way to get that house. But then I can't get that house. So what's the point of this house? Just rob hope. Just rob hope. In your home. But he says this. So now listen. He says, but. So let's go back and so we read it together. This, so who is wise and understanding among you? Those that are not comparing themselves with others. Let them show forth their life or let their life be done in one of humility. Like in other words, doing things where you're esteeming others better than yourself. Right? Or, or not trying to rival or compete. They, that comes from wisdom. In other words, keep on going here. That comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. I think this is huge, this portion, even this right here. It says, don't lie about if you have this in your heart. We lie about when we're pressed. How are you doing? Well, good. They're inside, I'm angry. I'm bitter. I'm jealous. I want to be better than them. I want to have this. This just goes on on the inside. Let's go to the next verse. Again, this all goes back to John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life and give you life more abundantly. God wants to give you life. God wants to give Nate life. God is concerned about Nate. God is concerned about Landon. God is concerned about you. God is concerned about Joe and taking Joe to where his heart desires and what God has placed in his life. Yeah, I know they're doing this over here, but God is thinking about Joe. I've come to give you life. Justin, I've come to give you life. Ty, I've come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. Your whole family flourishing. Just, just rock your world. I've come for you. He's coming to rock him. But no, listen, take this personal that God has come to you. And he wants to give you life and give it you abundantly. He said, so he says, if you're comparing yourself, if you're frustrated and, and, and you're rival, and he says, don't lie about it. He says, this wisdom, what, this, this understanding that you're, it doesn't come from above, but is earthly. Hmm, just stop right there. It's just by appearance. 
It's just by appearance. So you're making a move based on appearance. By a natural, you're making a move. And he says, it's unspiritual and demonic. And the next verse is what I wanted to get to. It says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder. This word disorder and every evil practice disorder just means like this. You can't figure out, the ball keeps dropping. It's like playing the game of 500. Any of you ever played that game 500? You throw the ball in the air, everyone tries to catch it. What's that called? Jackpot. Uh, you throw the football up and everybody's, and you say, this is 100 points. And everybody jumps up trying to grab the ball. And it's chaos. Or, you'll get this one. You got a bunch of ladies that want to get married. <laughs> and there's a bouquet. And whoever catches the bouquet, no matter what, you're going to be the next one to get married. So they say. So all these ladies that want to get married, they line up. And chaos is about to happen. No order, and things are going to get broken. The bouquet is going to get ripped. If you've ever been at any of those where, like, literally rip the bouquet out of somebody's hand, he says, there you're going to find, where there's envy, I want to get married. Where he says, there you're going to find disorder, chaos, confusion. You're not going to figure out how to put it to order. There's no clear who's it going to, who won that. Who, the, in our lives, so many times we're looking for a direction, but I'm confused, a chaos, all these kind of things. We're make, trying to make moves, and, and every evil practice. Can I tell you that so many times we think about strife, and we think about discord, we think about gossip, we think about what you're backbiting and this, but, but just striving, because you want what they got, because you're looking at natural things. If you, if you don't see something in your marriage that you really want to see. You don't see your husband or your wife. You see, you don't see your husband at seven o'clock in the morning before work with his Bible open. But instead, you see him grabbing his coffee to get out the door. You don't know that what's actually happening is he's in his truck while he's driving and he puts on that podcast and he's listening to the word and getting a, a, a hearing and talking to, with the Lord for that day, but because you don't know that and you don't see that and all you're looking at is natural appearances, what you have done is you've allowed every flood of demonic and confusion. So now you're saying you're trying to press a button and you're saying something manipulative to try to set his Bible there. Well, what, honey, have you seen my Bible? Yeah, it's right there on the table if you do. Yeah, well, yeah, well I always take it out of my truck. Why do you keep taking it out of my truck? Well, I don't want it just sitting in your dash. Doesn't just sit in my dash. You, because, but you're looking at, you're, you're, you're not believing the best. You're looking at things only un, in a natural way. And what's happening is you're trying to play signals and make moves because of what you see, just very naturally, and, and, and it's confusing. It's like, what, what, what's the clear signal? I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. What do you want me to do? And you're, it's driving a wedge. It's allowing the enemy to begin to talk, bring disorder, and now evil in that mist. It happens in, in families. You want things right. It happens in churches where you want things right. And the reason I bring churches up is because church is a family. Church is a family. Like it, it, The things you see in your house, God said, hey, you're a bride. The body of Christ is a bride. You'll see that what works in family works in houses. So if you've ever seen like division in a church or you see somebody's not somewhere you, and you only are looking at that piece and you don't know all of what anything, you will try to fix or do something, but you're not, you're not actually participating with heaven's order. You're bringing chaos and confusion. Does that make sense? Okay, let's go to the next one, next verse. But the wisdom that comes from above, first of all, is pure, then peace-loving. So here's, this is what I want to get to this morning, and then we've got two steps of action. The wisdom from above is pure. It's clear. You know what pure water is? It's just clear. It's not murky. It's not cloudy. It's not contaminated or in disorder. It's not chaos. It's pure. It's very clear. When the Lord, when you're not a, about rivalry and competition and about, I need this job because this is going to pay this much and allow me to have that and have that. Listen, no, 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 no. The wisdom that you need, you need pure, you need clear. And it, it, comes, it comes from heaven and is first all pure, then peace loving. I just wanted to define peace loving for you this morning. 
It's God's gift of wholeness which results from, from knowing or discerning the Lord's will and obeying it. This is what peace-loving, the wisdom of God, it says this, God's gift of wholeness, this, this peace-loving, there's a gift for you and I to be whole, which is a result of not going, well, they have this. No, it's a result of you knowing and finding out or discerning the will of the Lord and obeying it. You want peace in your life? Don't look over there. You want peace in your life? Don't look at what that house is doing. Don't look at what they're driving. You want peace in your church? Don't look at what that church is doing. Don't look at what is going on over here. Don't look at what's going on over here. You want peace in your marriage? You want your marriage bed to be right? Don't go looking at cosmopolitan magazines about how to please your husband 16 different ways only to find out that you're not getting pleased the way you should be pleased and now you're going to go try to find a way to get pleased. Young couples... You want to know how to, ha- how to please your husband or your wife? Ask the Lord. Put away the 17 in Cosmopolitan or Google how to Kama Sutra everything else and blah, blah, blah. And I, this is not too mature for this audience. You don't look out there to take care of here. You, you, you ask the Lord. I'm telling you, Adam and Eve did not have, and they knew how to make love. And it was right. And it was pure. And it was undefiled. And there wasn't something outside of the marriage bed coming into the marriage bed. Comparison kills. There's men that are like, I feel bad about myself and and how great I am. In a high school boys locker room, this is a real deal. Ladies, the same way. How big your body is or how small your body is. How big the top is or how little the top is. Or how whatever it might be. Compared to what? Compared to Photoshop? Compared to what? I like what I got here. I like what I got here. Well, I just don't know. I like what I got here. Take care of here. And what's happening is you'll find out the will of God. You'll be whole. Don't look for it out there. Find out here. Anyway, he goes on to say this. Consider uh, the love of God. It's considerate. It's submissive. It's full of mercy and good fruit. Impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. That will be the result. Not the Lord maketh rich and adds no sorrow to it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to close by two things that will kill comparison or, or tie up the thief. It's time to tie up the thief. You know, it's amazing how words can be released and they can continue to run. You know, have you ever said something you shouldn't have said, but yet somehow it's still running through that person's mind years later? Has somebody ever said something to you that they shouldn't have said, but yet every time you see them, you remember that encounter from 10 or 15 years ago? Words. So, You don't want to be discontent. You don't want to be comparing. You don't want to be, well, then can I tell you what you need to stop doing? Stop talking about what you don't have. Stop talking about what you don't know, what you can't do. Stop talking about what they have and stop talking about it. Now, I'm not just talking about where you know what's right. You know, we don't talk about them when they're around. We talk about them when it's just my husband and my wife or just with our kids. We don't compare grandma and grandpa with grandma and grandpa or nana and papa when they're around just with our kids when they're not around. Well, da, 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 da. You, want to, you want to kill the thief? You want to tie up the thief that you can't, you can't put your finger on where he's at? You can't figure out how to get him out of your house, but somehow... You, you're fighting this roller coaster of anger and depression, anger and depression. Can I tell you, anger and depression, most of everybody's facing, where you're facing anger or depression, it, it, it can go back to this thief of this. You're comparing, and you don't believe God came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. You don't see a future of hope. You see that their, their future is brighter than yours. You believe a lie, and you keep talking it. And you wonder why dandelion, we're blowing the 
dandelion of lies into our marriages, into our families, and we wonder why we can't get rid of it because we keep talking about what we don't have, what we can't do, instead of what he, what the Lord has done, how he's got good plans. I don't know about this, but let me tell you this. Man, we're going to have an awesome time tonight. I know they're down there at the beach. I know they're up there in the mountains. I know they're there, but guess what? We're going to have a, a s'mores tonight. It's going to be awesome. At the, like Kids are just going to be all jacked up having some s'mores at a backyard bonfire and you didn't know that you were missing something on vacation and you came up with an idea to tell a story and, 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 and play kick the can and all of a sudden life is better than it's ever been and you're interacting and you're because you're taking care of home take care of home base stop talking about it and get thankful you want to know what God's will is it starts with knowing what God's will is wisdom which is first of all peace loving Give thanks. First Thessalonians tells us this. You want to know what the will of God is for your life? Give thanks. First Thessalonians 5.18. When? When everything's perfect? When the car breaks? When the car is running great? When everything in marriage looks great? When it doesn't look so great? That's when you give thanks. No matter what's going on, give thanks. This is the will of God. You want wisdom on how to move something forward and how to build a life that you're going to be satisfied with? Tend your own work. Give thanks for what you have. Give thanks. And so I guess I wanted to close this morning by by this. I I, I want to stand, first of all. I I, I think that there's some time right now um, if you've been battling depression and you've been battling anger, you've been battling like just onslaught, onslaught of mental, uh, I think there needs to be um, just some time of repentance this morning where you and I would just say, Lord, I'm sorry for looking at natural things. I'm sorry for looking at a natural sign. You know what? It's amazing. I had this weird, I probably, is that cancer of the hip? Like, you know, you have a little sign little like click what was that well that was the mic on my or or that was from playing softball and I'm healing back up that was from but we we look at a natural thing then we look for a natural solution so we google and then all of a sudden I think my hip's gonna fall off in tomorrow (laughs) because I saw something and it led me to a place of chaos and you know what there's to be peace in homes There's to be peace in minds. There's to be joy in hearts and joy in homes. But it's going to come because we're going to begin to look not at all that we see. We're going to look and be thankful for what God has given us. And we're going to talk about what we do have. We're going to talk about what is right, what God is doing. Tell me what he is doing. But we're going to repent to the Lord. And we're going to make that turnaround this morning. Uh, It may not be everybody here, but I'm telling you, it's thick. It's thick. And we're going to say, Lord, put a guard over my mouth. We're going to say, Lord, that I would, that I, my, 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 my words would speak of what you can do, not what I don't have. That my words would speak of your goodness, not of magnifying the enemy. So, Father, just this morning, the posture of our hearts we just any place we've been looking at what we don't have or what we can't do any place we've been comparing ourselves with another looking at natural things or we just say we repent we make a move this morning with the words of our mouth we direct the course of our life and we say no more in our house Well, we look at what another house is doing, what another family is doing, another business, another marriage. And we say thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for what you're doing in our marriage, in my children. Thank you for what you're doing and that you truly came. I thank you for that, that you came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. We are asking right now that you would show us in the inside of our heart that we'd see a new picture of an abundant life. 
abundance in this house, whole families in the name of Jesus. We thank you for whole families in Jesus' name, whole families, abundant families, not missing and not lacking, uh, but, but according to your word, be it done unto this house, to these marriages, to these homes. We speak peace over marriages in the name of Jesus. We say fighting, stop. Measuring, be dissolved in the name of Jesus. Now celebrate one another. A celebrating, a place of celebration. A change from depression to celebrate in the name of Jesus. And that joy and peace would be the tracks and the traction of our days. It would, it would follow us. Surely goodness and mercy would follow all the days of our lives. We thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our children. We thank you. We don't look at where we've seen them. We look and we trust that you, Father, you're doing more than I can see. You're always working. You're never quitting. Father, thank you. And we rejoice that you are reaching, you are teaching our children even now. Thank you, Father. Thank you. We give thanks. We give you thanks. Will you just tell them thank you this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you honor in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here this morning you never met Jesus, uh, before we go, dismiss. If you're here and you, I forgot to do this last week, I was like, oh, man, baptism Sunday. And I forgot. But if you are here this morning, you don't know where you spend eternity. You've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. I want to give you an opportunity. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and you say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Confess him as Lord. You be saved. So if that's you, head bowed, the eyes closed. Just go ahead and lift your hand. Just right where you're at. Just get between you and the Lord. The Lord, that invitation is for you. Anybody here? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just with the strong, uplifted hand. Otherwise, I'm not going to see you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, it looks like we got, I don't see any hands. So let's just pray a prayer this, this morning as we go of this wall right here. Father, we're asking you to use us this week, your your people. We're disciples of you, taught of you. We're asking you to use us to bring hope, to bring help. Lord, to bring a healing beyond these four walls, to preach you, every one of us, as we go this week. Just use us to bring you glory so that others would encounter you. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night for bingo. Otherwise, if there's any flopping of the sanctuary, you can do that. That'd be awesome.